Hello and welcome. My name is Mr. Asprey. I'm the only maths YouTuber who's hit over 45 180s. And today I am taking you through Edexcel Maths A Level 2020 Pure Paper 1. So let's get into it. Okay, so first question is a binomial expansion question. And you will need to know the formula, or you won't need to know it because it's given in your formula booklet, but you'll need to know how to use it. And we're going to use this one because it's a fractional power in the binomial. As you can see, it's to the power of a half. So we have to use this formula for fractional or negative powers. Now, this one is already set up for us because the um, constant term is a 1 which is perfect because it's the same in, in the formula, it is also a one, so we can get just straight into it, we don't need to take out a factor. And we write one plus a half, open brackets, um, and then we put the eight x in there because that is the value for the x term. And then we plus, and then it's a half, close brackets, minus a half, and then we do eight x to the power of two, and we put that all over, the factorial 2. And then we carry on, so we do a half, and then we take 1 from that, so that's minus a half. Then we take 1 from that, again, which is minus uh, 3 over 2, and we do 8x cubed over 3 factorial. Okay, so I'm uh, I'm not going to go to the calculator. I Actually, I know what these answers are, so I'm just going to write them out, because it's just calculator work. Um, so I'm just going to substitute in those values to get my uh, ascending powers of x. So I'm going to get 1 plus 4x, and this one will be a negative because there is a negative sign in there, and that will give you 8x squared. And this one, the two negatives will cancel, and we end up with 32x cubed. Okay, question B. We are have been asked to explain how you could use... 1 over 32 in the expansion to find an approximation for root 5. My head's just covering that, but yeah, that's that's the square root of 5. Okay, so what we would do is we would sub in the value x is equal to uh, 1 over 32 into our original um, binomial, which is 1 plus 8x to the power of a half, so we've just subbed that x value in, and then we're just going to find out, see what that gives us. Hopefully it gives us root 5, if not, then we can manipulate it somehow. So in fact, 8 over 32 is a, is a quarter, so that bracket can simplify down to 5 quarters, because it's 1 plus, and then if I write that, I can write that as root 5 over root 4, which is 2, so root 5 over 2. So that's not quite what we wanted, but all we'll need to do then is sub in our x value equals 3, uh, 1 over 32, into the expansion, which we've, which we've created, 1 plus 4x minus 8x squared plus 32x cubed. And then after that, we will just multiply by 2 in order to get root 5, rather than getting root 5 over 2. Okay, scroll down, and question number two is a logarithms question. It tells you what to do to take logarithms of both sides. Um, this is something which you will need to memorize, which are the log rules. So I've kind of highlighted that in pink, because that means that you need to memorize it. You won't be given that in the formula booklet. And this question, well, I mean, it literally tells you what to do. It says take logs of both sides. So that's what I'm going to do. So I'm going to take log 4, 3p minus 1 equals log 5 to the power of 210. And then I'm going to use the power law for logarithms, which essentially tells us that I can take um, the power, the exponent, and I can bring it down to become the coefficient. So the 3p minus 1 comes down to the front, and the 210 comes down to the front as well. Now I want to solve for, for 3p minus 1. So I'm going to divide through by log 4 on both sides to get 3p minus 1. I'm then going to add 1 to get an expression for 3p. Uh, 
And then once I've done that, I'm going to um, divide by three to get an expression for P. So it'd be one third of 210 log five over log four plus one. And then that can go directly in your calculator. It says to one decimal place. So I would fire up the calculator, whack that in, I'm trying to find the calculator. Can't quite find it, um, but I actually know what the answer is, and hopefully you can check that to make sure it is right. And it's 81.6, and that is question two done. Okay, question three is a vectors question, and you're given the position vector of A, position vector of B, and the position vector of C and you're asked to work out the vector a to b. So let's just explain what a to b is. So if I was to draw a anywhere in space and b anywhere in space, it would be relative to an origin. And if I wanted to go to a to b, I could first go to o, and that would be writing... Um, Sorry, that would be the, the negative of O to A. So it's the opposite of going from O to A. It's going from A to O. And then after that, I could go from O to B. So the vector AB is equal to minus OA plus OB. Or we could write that in a more general sense, in a neater sense. AB is always equal to OB minus OA. And that is definitely something you would need to know as that crops up all the time. So I'm going to highlight that in pink as something you should try and memorize. Okay, so let's work out what AB is then. So A to B is O to B, which is the position vector of B. And I'll write that as a column because I find it easier to do calculations in column form. Uh, 3 minus 3 minus 4. And then I'll take away OA, which is 2, 5 minus 6. And that would give me 1 minus 8 and 2. And then if I wanted to, I could write that as um, a, sorry, i minus 8j plus 2k. Okay, so next we're looking at the trapezium OABC. Now, what is a trapezium? A trapezium has one parallel set of sides. It could have two parallel sets of sides as well, but essentially the definition of a trapezium is it just has at least one parallel set of sides. So I'm not quite sure where this question is going, so I'm just going to draw a quick diagram because that can sometimes help visualize to see what the question is asking us. And the trapezium is OABC, so I'll write that around the vertices of the trapezium. And now, if vectors are parallel, then they are one multiple of the other. So I can see here that OC is 2 minus 16 plus 4, which is actually a multiple of the vector we've just worked out, which is 2 times AB. So because OC is equal to 2 times AB, it means that OC and AB are parallel. And if they're parallel, it means that we must have a trapezium if we can see the diagram, OB and OC are opposite uh, sides and they're parallel, so therefore it must be a trapezium. Okay, then let's scroll down to question number three. Sorry, question number four. Uh, functions question. Okay, so this question, you're looking for the inverse function subbing in 7 into the inverse function. Now, it's only a two mark question, so I'm not going to work out the inverse function. Instead, I'm going to have a, I'm going to show you um, how domain and ranges work. So if I've got a set of a domain, then I pass it through a function, it gives me a set of ranges, and then if I pass it back, then that would be what's called the inverse function. So it's asking me what is the value of 7 if I pass it through the inverse function? Well, whatever that value is, it must be in the original domain of f. So the question is saying the inverse of 7 is the same as 
what x value can I pass through f to get 7? So all I need to do in a more a simple approach rather than bothering finding the inverse function is just to solve f of x equals 7. And I know f of x is 3x minus 7 over x minus 2. And if that's set equal to 7, then I can just solve this using some algebra by multiplying up the, um, the denominator and then expanding those brackets. And then... Um, moving the 3 over and moving the 14 over to get x is equal to uh, 7 over 4. Perfect. So there's those two marks done. And next we're looking for the composite function of um, f of f of x. So f of f of x means placing f inside itself. So replacing every x in f of x with f of x itself. So I write 3, but then instead of x, I write 3x minus 7 over x minus 2. Close brackets, and then minus 7. And then that's all over x, but I don't write x, I write 3x minus 7 over x minus 2. So 3x minus 7 over x minus 2 and then take away 2. Now whenever you have um, fractions which have fractions inside them, it's best to multiply through by the denominator of those fractions. So I'm going to multiply top and bottom by x minus 2. And of course, timesing the top and the bottom of a fraction will keep the fraction the same, because you're timesing through by 1. And what it's going to do is all those terms that do have that denominator, it's going to cancel them right off. So that now I just have a fraction which has no fractions inside it. And now it's just an algebra task now by expanding these brackets and simplifying. So I'm going to get 9x minus 21 minus 7x plus 14 over 3x minus 7 minus 2x plus 4. And that gives me 2x minus 7 over x minus 3. Perfect. Okay, let's move on. Question number four is a sequences question where we have arithmetic and we have geometric sequences. So what I've done here is I've written down the um, formulas for the geometric and arithmetic uh, sequences. So it's, these are the nth term for each of those particular sequences. Uh, and I've done it in pink because we're not given those, so you have to remember them. Now, this question is asking for an arithmetic sequence, and it tells you the first term and the sixth term, and it's asking you to find the third term. So what I can do is I can write that the sixth term, which I can denote a um, n, or, sorry, a6, because it's the sixth term, and that will equal the first term, which is 100 and oh sorry yeah these the sixth term will be 115 and that will equal the first term a which is 28 and then that will be plus 6 minus 1 which is 5 times by d so great straight off the bat we can solve for d and that will give us the um that will give us the difference between each of the gears in this sequence so dividing through 87 over 5 and that is going to give us 17.4. Um, okay, now that we have the difference in the sequence, we can find A3, which is the first term, A, which is 28, plus 3 minus 1, which is 2, multiplied by D, which is 17.4. Uh, we have 62.8 yeah, kilometers per hour. To the minus one. Perfect. Okay, now we just need to do that again essentially, but this time we are, um, the sequence has been modeled as a geometric sequence and we're looking for the fifth term. Okay, so um, again we know the sixth term is the same as before, which is 115, but the geometric sequence is we take the first term, 28, and we multiply it by the ratio 
to the um, n minus 1, which is 6 minus 1, which is 5. So dividing through by 28, that will equal r to the 5. So r will be the fifth root of 115 over 28, which is equal to 1.3265. Okay, great. So now we need to find the third term. No, we don't need to find the third term. We need to find the, yeah, and I made a mistake here. No, we need to go back. We need to find the fifth term because the question asks for the fifth term. So that would be A5 would equal 28R. Yeah, A5 will equal 28R to the 5 minus 1. Perfect. Yeah, that's the fifth term. Okay, which gives us 28 multiplied by 1.3265 to the power of 4. And that value is 86.7. Okay, great. Uh, question number 6 is your classic type trig function r sine x plus alpha. Now, I've got a top tip for this one. I love these questions. And don't bother expanding out that r sine. Well, you can do, but this is much quicker. I know it's a sine because it says r sine x plus alpha. So I'm going to highlight the sine, and that coefficient is 1. And therefore, I call that a. And the other coefficient will be cos. I call that b, which is equal to 2. And then all I need to do is just write that r is equal to a squared plus b squared, square rooted, which is root 5. And uh, alpha will always be tan to the minus 1 of the b value over the a value, which in this case will be tan to the minus 1 of 2 over 1, which is just tan to the minus 1 of 2. And that gives us a value of 1.107. There's three marks, easy as can be, um, and, you, and you don't need to do any more working than that. That will get you the three marks. Okay, now we need to have a look at how this has been transformed. Um, so we have replaced x with pi t over 12 minus 3, and we've also added on 5 as well. That's an important part. So let's rewrite theta as 5 plus, and we're going to use root 5 with our r value, sine and then our x is actually now pi t over 12 minus 3. And then we plus alpha, which is 1.107. So that is our new constructed trig function, which only has one trig function in it, sine. So we can manipulate it much easier and work out, for instance, the maximum temperature, which is the next question. So if I draw a sine graph, you'll notice that the maximum of a sine graph is always 1. So therefore, the maximum that theta could possibly be occurs when that sine function is equal to 1. So I say theta max is equal to 5 plus root 5 times by 1, because sine of whatever the input is, it, the maximum it could possibly be is 1. So that gives me a max value of 5 plus root 5, which is equal to 7.24 degrees. Okay, the next question asks me when, what time of day this maximum occurs. So what I will need to do is I will need to solve the trig equation whereby that sine is equal to 1. And I know that happens at pi over 2, if you can see from the graph there. So I want this sine to be maximized. So I'll write that sine um, pi t over 12 minus 3 plus 1.107. I want that to equal 1 because that's when the maximum occurs. So therefore, I want the input, which is this pi t over 12 minus 3 plus 1.107 to equal pi over 2. And then all that's left is just to rearrange that. So I'm going to get my calculator out. And um, that's 
I'm going to put in my values there um, and solve this. So I'm going to subtract the 1.107, add the 3, then I'm going to times it by 12, divide it by pi, and that gives me 13.23. And then I'm going to press this little cheeky button on the calculator, which turns it into an actual time. It's the button underneath the square root button. So that tells me that it's 13 hours, 13 minutes, and 50 seconds. Um, so we have an answer of 13 hours, 13 minutes, and 50 seconds. Job done. Um, and I guess we could round this to the nearest minute, which might be acceptable. Yeah, who cares? It's fine. Okay, right, let's go on to the next question. Okay, question seven. We have a... Um, okay, we've got a straight line and we've got a quadratic essentially, and we don't know what any of these uh, equations are. We don't know what the quadratic is or the straight line. And we need to define this region using inequalities. So first off, we need to really figure out what these lines actually are. So let's start with the um, equation of the straight line, which should be the most straightforward, because we know the gradient is equal to 25 minus um, 13. So the change in the y over the change in the x and the x value is 0 and then it goes to minus minus 2. So the gradient is 12 over 2 which is equal to 6. So I know that y, uh, so now I can do y minus y1 is equal to 6x minus um, x1 and I'll use 13 and minus 2 there and that will give me when I expand out 6x plus 12 and then plus the 13, so 25. Ah, but of course, I could have known that straight away, actually, because it's clearly obvious that the y-intercept is 25. So I didn't need to do that. <laughs> but hey, why not? Um, now I need to use this information to, to work out the, um, the quadratic. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to set up a completed square um, because I know where the minimum point is. And I know that the minimum point uh, can be um, ascertained from the completed the square format. So that quadratic there I've written as completed the square form, um, where I've got an x plus b all squared multiplied by some value plus c. And now what I can do is I can um, sub in that minimum point at the bottom, as um, I would just show you now what I would do. So the y value will be equal to a, and then x will be um, plus 2, such that the x value of minus 2 would then make that bracket 0. And then plus 13 is the, um, is the actual y value. OK, now I can use another point on the... Uh, quadratic graph because the other point I have is 0 25 because just just to, again to go back to this um, this completed square whenever you have a completed square the value of x of which solves the bracket so in this case minus 2 is the x value of the minimum and then that whole bracket will disappear to 0 which will leave you with 13 which is the y value of that minimum and now what I could do is I can substitute in my uh, second point on the quadratic and use that as the x and the y. And this means I'll be able to solve for a. So I'll get 4a plus 13. Uh, take the 13 to the other side will give me 12. Divide through by 4 will give me a equals 3. So now I know what the two lines are. I know the um, quadratic, which I'll write down here. 
And I also know the linear line, which we worked out first, which was 6x plus 25. And now I just need to know which one is on top of which. So the straight line is on top of the quadratic. So the straight line is above the quadratic. In fact, the y value of the straight line is always going to be higher than the y value of the quadratic. So as it shows there, that straight line is always above that um, the, the quadratic. So I can say that the y value is in between. The straight line will be on top and the quadratic will be on the bottom as such. And that question is done. So let's go on to the next one. Oh, this question, what on earth is this question? I don't know what Edexcel are playing at. This is it's just ridiculous. It's essentially it's a ridiculous question. Um, it says that the company observed that the rate of increase of n is proportional to n. Find a suitable equation for n in terms of t. So f first off, you're just you're kind of just meant to know this, okay? Even though in the textbook it never says that you're meant to know it or you need to know it, but in order to work it out, is more work than two marks is worth. So just this question is just absolutely bizarre. But anyway, I'll show you how you would work out a solution to this differential equation, which is not worth two marks. So essentially, you can just remember that this is a general solution to this particular differential equation. Anyhow, let's get into it. So the rate of increase of n is dn by dt, because rate always means how it's changing with respect to time. And that's proportional to n. As states in the question, which means that dn over dt is equal to some constant multiplied by n, which is um, how proportionality works. You have a constant of proportionality to set it equal to each other. I can then multiply both sides um, by uh, dt and divide both sides by n to separate the variables and get all the n's on one side and all the t's on the other side. I can then integrate both sides, and the integral of 1 over n is ln n. And the integral of k with respect to t is kt, plus some constant, let's call it c. Next, I can, uh, I can work out that um, n is equal to ln, sorry, e to the kt plus c. And therefore, I can split up these e's, because when I add two powers, I, um, uh, when the two powers are added, it's the same as multiplying the two bases of those two powers. So I get e to the kt multiplied by e to the c. I can then do a constant swap because e to the c is actually just a constant, and I can swap it out for, let's say, a capital A. So I get n is equal to a multiplied by e, k to the k, e to the kt. Now that is, the, that is a general solution to a differential equation whereby the rate of n is proportional to n. Now, again, if you do further maths, you might know that as standard because we use those um, general solutions when we solve second order uh, differential equations. But um, apparently you're just meant to know that for two marks. Bizarre. Okay, question nine. Far more standard, classic differentiation question. And you will need to use the product rule here. And I was about to label it in pink, but no, you're given this, fantastic. So let's label it in green, because that one is one that you are given. You have a function, which is a product, um, two things multiplied together, and we need to work out the derivative of that function. So we set u equal to uh, four, open brackets, x minus two, over, and then we'll set v equal to e to the uh, minus two x. We'll do u dash, differentiate that. Well, I could expand those brackets out to get 4x squared, and that will differentiate to 8x. And um, the constant term there, minus 8, will differentiate to 0. 
And then differentiating this, I bring down the derivative of minus 2x, which is minus 2. And then that's e to the minus 2x of that. Okay, now those are um, differentiated. I can do my uh, cross multipl multiplication to get us um, a overall derivative of. So let's multiply first the 4 and the minus 2, which will give us minus 8. And then I'm going to get um, x squared minus 2 and e to the minus 2x. So I've just multiplied those two terms together. Now let's multiply the other two terms together. I'm going to get 8x e to the minus 2x. Great. And now we can see that the derivative they want us to give is in factorized form. So I can take out a factor here of um, 8 um, e to the minus 2x. Yes, let's take out an 8 as well. There we go. And what is that going to leave us with? Um, the Let's do that term first because it's positive. So that will leave me with an x, just an x. And then let's do the other term, which is negative. So minus x squared uh, minus 2. Okay, perfect. Now we can simplify that bracket inside there. Uh, so I'll get 8e to the minus 2x. And I will get, um, that's positive 2, because there are two negatives there, plus x minus x squared. I think that's how they want it. Let's double check that. That is how they want it. Yes, that seems pretty perfect to me. Okay, next part. It says, find in simplest form um, the exact coordinates of the stationary points of C. Okay, so the stationary points are where the gradient is equal to 0. So I'll set the um, derivative equal to 0. Now, what part of that derivative is going to give us a 0? Well, that e part will never give us a 0 because e to the power of x will never equal 0, so nor will e to the minus 2x. So the 0 is going to come from the quadratic inside those brackets, which is 2 plus x minus x squared equals 0. Um, I'm going to multiply both sides by negative 1, uh, because I always like my um, x squareds to be positive. And then I'm going to factorize that to get x minus 2, x plus 1, and that's going to give me two x values of 2 and minus 1. Fantastic. And um, what does the question, it says find the exact coordinates of the stationary points. Oh, that's going to be long. So now I need to work out the y values as well. So I'm just going to substitute my x values into the y function which was the function which we were given right at the start. And that function is um, 4 lots of x squared, so 4 lots of 2 squared minus 2, e to the minus 2x, or e to the minus 2 times 2, which is 4. And I need to sub it in for the other x value as well, so that's 4x squared, or minus 1 squared, minus 2, e to the minus 2x, or just e to the 2. Uh, so simplifying down, so that's 2 squared minus 2 is 2 times 4, so it's 8e to the minus 4. And over here we are um, minus, or we're, no, minus 1, we're minus 4e squared, perfect. Okay, so those are our two... Um, um, yeah, our, our two stationary points, the, the yellow one and the red one. Lovely. Okay, I'm going to zoom out for this bit because this is possibly one of the hardest parts of the paper because students absolutely hate the range. You know, like, when they see the range, they're like, oh my God, what's going on? Um, so I'm going to try and explain this as carefully as I possibly can. First off, that g of x is equal to 2f of x means that graph has been transformed. And when we transform by uh, 2f of x, we stretch the graph down below the axis and we stretch it above, up above the axis by a factor of 2. 
So the new graph would look something like that. It would come down much lower, it would go up higher, and then it would trail off like that. Now, the upwards part of the uh, graph will just go on to infinity. If we look left, it will just keep going up and up and up. So it has no limit on the, uh, the upward side. But if we're going down in the y value, we do have a limit. Uh, and it will be that stationary point down at the bottom. Now, what was the stationary point? It was minus 1, minus 4, e squared. So after the transformation, that will change into the, the y coordinate will change into minus 8, e squared because we are um, transforming it by a factor of 2. So therefore, we've got our range. We, the range is that the y value has to be greater than minus 8 e to the minus 2, because that's the smallest it could possibly be, and there's no upwards limit, so there's no way that I'm not going to cu cut it off at any point. It's going to keep on going up if it needs to. Uh, so remember, the range is the set of all the possible y values, and we've just found that for the g of x. Okay, let me um, uh, now look at the h of x1. Now, the h of x1, um, the transformation is it's been doubled. We've also then subtracted 3, which means the graph is going to move down 3 after it's been stretched. And we're only looking at a domain of x greater than 0. So we're only looking at the positive x-axis here. We're not looking at the bit on the left. Okay, which means that minimum point is no longer in play because that's where the x is, is negative. So what's it going to look like? Well, it's going to get stretched, and it's also going to get moved down by um, by 3. So first off, I've stretched it, and then I've moved it down by 3. So this is the one that we need to look at here. So it's going to look roughly like that. So what's the range? Well, the range is the set of all the possible y values and the y values are contained in between the y axis where it hits the y intercept sorry and that maximum point there as i've highlighted in uh, in gold okay so we need to find these values so first off let's find where the y intercept is now the original function i will set x equal to 0 and i will then sub in x equals 0 to find where the the y intercept is so I get 4 minus 2 e to the 0, which is going to give me minus 8. Yeah, just minus 8. Okay. And now after the transformation, what is the y-axis going to, um, what's the y-intercept going to be? Well, I need to double it, and then I need to take away 3, because I'm going to stretch it by 2, and then I'm going to take away 3. So that new y-intercept is at minus 19. So that's the lower bound of the limit of the range, sorry. And now what about the upper limit of the range? Well, that is where the um, turning point is. And that turning point we found out before is at 2, 8, e to the 4. So I need to take that y value of 8, e to the 4, and I'm going to have to double it. Oh, sorry, it was 8, e to the minus 4. I need to um, double it and then um, minus 3. So uh, I'm going to double it and minus 3, and that gives me the y value of the upper bound of the range. So the range is that the y is restricted between minus 19, which it can equal, um, and also... Um, Mine, uh, 16 e to the minus 4 minus 3 which again it also can equal as well and there we have it and straight on to question number 10 look at that seamless transition there question number 10 is an integration by um, substitution question and I'm always going to start this off by um, well, differentiating with respect to u and I'm going to get 2 d by d by d so dx by du equals 2u, so dx equals 2u du. Um, so once you've done that first differentiation, you've got an expression for dx, which is great, so I'm going to substitute that in. I'm then going to look at the, um, uh, the substitution. I'm going to rearrange it and uh, get a value for um, u. Okay, so that's helpful. So now I've got a, um, a value for u and I've got a value for x. They could be helpful. 
And then the next thing I'm going to do is going to look at the limit. So I'm going to draw a little table and I'm going to have x on one side, u on the other. And I'm going to ask myself the question, well, when x is 10, what is the u value going to equal? Well, the u value, as we can see from that uh, bottom line um, of that, uh, the, where it says root x minus 1 equals u. I just have to take the x value of 10 minus 1 and root it, which is going to give me 3. And the x value of being 5, I will take... Um, yes, that one will be 3. And this one will be 5 minus 1, which is 4. Rooted is 2. Okay, great. So I've got all my stuff done now. I'm ready to substitute in. So my integral is not 10 anymore. It's 3. And it's not 5 anymore. It's 2. I've got 3, and then dx is the first thing I'm going to change, which is 2u du. Then on the bottom, I've got x minus 1, which I can see from that second line is the same as u squared. So I can replace um, x minus 1 with a u squared. And then the next part, I've got 3 plus 2 root x minus 1. Well, I know root x minus 1 is u, so I've actually got 3 plus 2u. So in brackets, 3 plus 2u. Great. And now all that's left to do is just to simplify it and express it in the same way they've asked you to, which I believe is 6u on top. Oh no, the u's will cancel. Great. So there's a u on top and a u squared on the bottom. So they will cancel. So I get 6 on top, du, and I get u, open brackets, 3 plus 2u. Great. And that's what they've asked for. So fantastic. Now we need to integrate that. And that is a partial fraction. So I set up my partial fraction by writing 6 u over 3, sorry, over u 3 plus 2u. And I write a over u plus b over 3 plus 2u. I then multiply both sides by u and by 3 plus 2u to get rid of that denominator to make it 6. The u will cancel, so I'm just left with 3 plus 2u a. And here, the 3 plus 2u will cancel, so I'm just left with bu. Now I'm going to let u equal 0, because that will cancel the, um, the bu out completely, and leave me only in terms of a. So I'll get 6 is equal to, and then um, if u is 0, we get 3a, which means that a is equal to 2. And next, I'm going to let u equal minus 3 over 2 because that will cancel the a bracket. So I will get um, 6. I will get 6 equals bu, which is minus 3 over 2u. Uh, b, sorry. And then timesing by 2, dividing by minus 3 will give me minus 4. And now I can uh, set my integral up. So my new integral is 3 over 2, and I've got um, a is 2, so a over, over u, and I've got minus 4 over 3 plus 2u, du. And now I can integrate each one. So I'm going to do it separately. This is what I like to do. And what I've done is I've taken out a 2 because I want the denominator's derivative of u to be the numerator. And in this case, um, the denominator is u, so the derivative of that is 1. So I want the numerator to be 1, so I've taken out a factor of 2. And the next one, I'm going to take out a factor of minus 2, such that now I've got 2 on top, and I've got 3 plus 2u. And again, the, the denominator derivative is now 2 which is the numerator, because I want the denominator's derivative to be the numerator. And again, there we go, the denominator is 2u, and the derivative of that is 2, so now I can integrate directly. So I get two lots of ln u, because when we get this situation, the integral is, um, is just ln of the denominator. And here I get minus two lots of ln 3 plus 2u. And that's between uh, 3 and 2. And now we just need to do some nifty ln rules. So they 
uh, we could take out a factor of two. Um, so I can write two. And then because I've got these two learns are subtracted, I can write one over the other using my log rules. So learn of u over three plus two u. You don't have to do that. Uh, I'm just being a bit fancy. I'm thinking it might help. It might not even help. I don't even know. Learn u, and we're going to get sub in three. So that's three over three plus six, which is nine. So it's, um, yeah, ln of uh, three over nine. And then we take away when I sub in two, which is two lots of ln two over three plus four, which is seven. Which is seven. Which is seven. There we go. And now what I could do is all those twos, the co those coefficients are a bit annoying actually. Let's use the log rule to bring that two up to the power. So three over nine is simplified to a third. And then if I bring the two up, it becomes a squared. So squaring a third gives me a ninth. And again, if I bring the two up here, squaring uh, two over seven is four over 49. And now I can combine those learns again because they're subtracted. It means I can do one divided by the other. So a ninth divided by four over 49, which gives 49 over 36. Yeah, so it'll learn of. Let me write that learn in there quickly. Perfect. Okay, question 11 is a circles question. Now you're going to need to know that the area, uh, sorry, the equation of a circle, so I will color that in pink because that's something that's not given in the formula booklet. You need to know that. We want to work out the angle AOB, any other business. So I will draw a little line connecting A, O, and B, and I will label that angle in there. Um, okay, so. These two equations need to be simultaneously solved in order to work out the coordinates of A and B. So I will rearrange the first circle's coordinate to get y squared is equal to 100 minus x squared. And then I will substitute that into the second circle's equation. So I'll get x minus 15 all squared plus 100 minus x squared rather than plus y squared equals 40. I can then expand that bracket to get x squared minus 30x plus 225 plus 100 minus x squared equals 40. I can then uh, cross out those x squareds, write minus 30x plus 325 is equal to 40. And that will give me that 30x is equal to, do a little swooping round, 285. So getting the calculator out, let me move my head out of the way. That gives me 285 over, um, yeah, over 30, which is 9.5. Brilliant. So that is the x coordinate. So now let's find the y coordinate by subbing back into the one of the equations. So the simplest one is the y squared 100 uh, minus um, x squared. So subbing in gives me that and then put that into my calculator. I'm going to get plus or minus the square root of 100 minus 9.5 squared, which is plus or minus root 39 over 2. Root 39 over 2. Great. Now, what does that tell us? Well, if I scroll up, I've now worked out the coordinates of A and B, the intersection of those two circles, which means that I can now draw this triangle, which has, an, which has the angle alpha in there, which is half of the one I'm looking for. And the y, or the height of that triangle is root 39 over 2, because that's the y value. 
and the width of that triangle is 9.5 because that was the x value we found where those two um, uh, circles intersect. Whoops, right, there's that triangle back. Okay, so now we can use our calculator to work out that value for alpha, which is half of the angle we're trying to find. So I do tan to the minus one of root 39 over two, sorry, root, yeah, root 39 over two, so that's it, right, root 39 over two, over the um, uh, the adjacent, which is uh, 9.5, and then I would multiply that angle by two, because uh, by symmetry, uh, we want the angle AOB, so that gives me 0 0.6. Five. So I just write in my working here um, because I'm a very good student and I always show my working and I times it by two so I get 0 0.635 to three significant figures. Bosh. Next question asks me to work out the perimeter of the shaded region. Well the first bit I can do is I can work out the perimeter of this part of of the shape, this circle here, because that is a, that's an arc length, and the formula for an arc length is r theta, which again, you're not given, so I'm gonna highlight that in purple, because you need to remember that, that's for the arc length. And the, um, the radius of that particular circle is 10, because um, we can see here we've got uh, uh, 100, because that's the value for r squared. And the angle I'm looking for is the complementary angle to AOB. It's the reflex angle to AOB. So it's 2 pi minus the angle AOB. So I would go into my calculator and I would do 2 pi minus the answer and then I'll times it by 10 and I'll get 56.5 will be my angle. No, sort of my angle, my perimeter or yeah, the perimeter of that part of the, the shape. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to set up another triangle so I can try and work out that angle in there, which means I'll then be able to do the same thing for the other circle. Now, that center of that circle is at 15. So let's just draw that triangle out a bit bigger. And the x-coordinate at that point is 15. And that goes all the way to where we intersected with the other circle, which was 9.5. So therefore, the x um, has a width of 5.5. And the height is the same as the last one because it's the same intersection point in the y. So now I can work out the angle in that circle, um, which will be tan to the minus 1 of root 39 over 2, which means I've got to put that into my calculator again. Um, hopefully I can do it a bit more smoother this time. Over the width, which is 5.5. Right, come on, let's do this. Tan to the minus one, square root sign, root 39, over two, nice, over two, over 5.5, Bosch, 0 0.516. I've got to times that by two though, because I want, um, so I put 0.516 there, but I've got to times that by two, to get the overall um, uh, sort of like interior angle. Uh, so theta times by two is equal to 1.03. Yeah, 1.03, great. Get rid of that triangle and let's work out the perimeter of that circle now by using the same thing as I did last time, r theta, whereby r is the radius of that circle, which is root 40, because that circle has a radius squared of 40, so it has a radius of root 40. And we're going to get 2 pi minus 1.03, and that needs to go into the calculator. And I get 2 pi minus 1.03 multiplied by root 40, which gives me 33.2. And then finally, this question is a long question for four marks. I've got to add those two perimeters together to get the total perimeter. 
so it's 56.5 plus 33.2. So on my calculator, just add 56.5 to that. And that is 89.5. That is, that's a pretty stingy four marks, really. Uh, it took quite a long time to earn those four marks. Okay, let's go. And here we are, question 12. Just zoom in a bit. This is a classic, absolute classic, trig identity followed by trig equation type question. So these are uh, reciprocal trig functions, so you're going to know what each of them means. Top tip, the third letter tells you which function is it reciprocal of. So C for cos, so sec gives you cos, cosec gives you sine, and cot gives you tan. Okay, so cosec is one over sine, and minus sine. Um, this is the left-hand side, so I always start actually by writing left-hand side equals, because remember this is an identity, we're not trying to solve an equation yet, we are trying to show that the left-hand side is the same as the right-hand side. Um, uh, this is a fraction, so I'd write it as a, um, as a complete fraction, so I want to write sine as sine squared over sine, which gives me a, a common denominator, so I can write 1 minus sine squared over sine uh, theta in this case and we also know that 1 minus sine squared of course is cos squared so therefore we have cos squared over sine so I can write that as cos theta over sine theta times cos theta um, actually well yeah that's let me write it the other way around actually let me write it as cos theta times by cos over sine. And that way we get nice and neatly to cos theta and cos over sine is cot. So we get cos cot. Um, right. This next part is quite tricky. So we can see here that those two are identical, the two green parts. So therefore I can replace um, the green in the equation I'm about to solve with that blue part there. So I can write that cos cot is actually equal to cos cot 3x minus 50. So cos x cot x is equal to cos x cot 3x minus 50. Okay, now very tempting first off to do is just divide through by cos x which we can do, but we have to be very careful. If we are to divide through by cos x, then we lose a solution, and that solution is that cos x equals zero. Because let's just suppose cos x did equal zero, then would our equation solve? Well, yes, it would, because if cos was zero, that would be zero, and that would be zero, which means the whole of the left side would be zero, and the whole of the right side would be zero, so they are equal, so it would be a legitimate solution. So, I am going to divide through by cos x, but I'm also going to note that that gives us a solution that cos x could equal 0. And if cos x equals 0, then cos to the minus 1 of 0 is, um, is 0. Um, God, well, complete my blank. Why is it 0? No, it's not 0. Sorry, it's 90. Um, yes, of course. So cos x of 0 happens when the x value is 90, that's when it crosses the x-axis. Okay, so that's one solution in the bag. Okay, now I can divide through by that cos x and I get that cot x is equal to cot 3x minus 50. Okay, so uh, because we've got cot of something equals cot of something else, well those two things must be the same in order for our equation to work. So I can write that x is equal to 3x minus 50. Okay, but we also need to consider the fact that when you solve a trig equation, there are multiple solutions. And when you solve for cot, because cot has a period of 180, I can plus or minus 180 to my solution and it will still be a valid solution. So I have to write here plus minus 180. Okay, so now 
um, solving this would give me that 2x would equal 50. Or, because of the plus minus here, 180, I could also have that 2x could equal um, 230. That would also work. So dividing through by 2 will give me 25 and it would give me 115. And those are the only two possibilities within inside the range that we were given. Okay, another seamless transition there. On to question 13. And this is a... Sequences question where we've got a recurse, re recurrive, uh, recursive sequence and it has a period of order three and that means that every three terms it will repeat. So let's start with A1. A1 is given its two. Let's start with A2. I need to sub two, the previous term, into the recursive formula so I get k 2 plus 2 over 2 and that's equal to 4k over 2 which is equal to 2k. And then we just keep going. Let's go for A3. Why not? Sub the last term into that recursive formula. So I get K, 2K plus 2 over 2K. Um, I can divide through by K top and bottom. And I can also divide through by 2 top and bottom to get K plus 1. Okay, why stop there? Let's keep going. A to the 4. Sub it in. We get K, open brackets. K plus 1 plus 2 all over k plus 1. But ha, wait, we now know, or we now have, a first and fourth term, and they should be the same, because it is a period of three, which means that every third term is exactly the same as, um, well, they're the same. So I can now write an equation that 2, which is the first term, is equal to the fourth term, which is k, open brackets, k plus 3, 1 plus 2 is 3, uh, newsflash, all over k plus 1. And this can be solved. Uh, well, not solved, it can be rearranged. Uh, well, it can be solved, but we're not solving it yet. Rearrange it, so move the k plus 1 up to the other side, expand the brackets, and then write it in the way they want it, which is that k squared plus k minus 2 equals 0. Great. And next part says, explain why k cannot equal 1. Well, let's do a little um, assumption here. Let's do a little contradiction. Let's assume that k could equal 1. So, and see if we run into any bother. Well, a1 will be 2. That we know already. That was given. And a2 would equal 2k. And if k is 1, then 2k is 2. Ah, We've already found bother because we can't have a1 equal to a2 because we are told this has a period of three and this repeats every term, not every three terms. So this is a contradiction as not a period of three. So therefore, the assumption is wrong. K can't equal one, so K does not equal one. Part C, find the value of what on earth is that? That is the summation That's the summation. Uh, we know, oh, sorry, first off, we know that k doesn't equal 1. So therefore, what can k equal? Well, it must solve that quadratic, which we've uh, ascertained from the first um, question. So let's solve that quadratic. And that gives us k equals 1, which we know it can't be. It gives us k equals minus 2. So let's sub in some values to work out these terms. So I know the first term is equal to 2. The second term is 2k, so that's minus 4. The third term is k plus 1, which is minus um, 1. Okay, so after that, all the terms will repeat. So what we can do is we can collect up those first three terms. And I want to sum all the way up to 80. Well, if I do 80 divided by 3, I get 26 and 2 remainder. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to collect up those first three terms. And I'm going to multiply it by 26, which will give me 78 terms. And then after that, I will just need to add on two more terms, which will be the first and the second term. So I'm going to take those three terms, times it by 26, which again will give me 78 terms. And then I will need to um, 
add on two more terms, 2 and minus 4. And that is minus 3 times 26, which is minus 78. And then we're adding on to minus 4, which gives me a total of minus 80. Great. And that's that question done. Let's move on to the next one. Is it going to be a smooth? Oh, look at that. Seamless. All right. This type of question students find the most challenging. Differential equations. We have a radius R and a volume V. It's decreasing at a constant rate. Use this model to show that blah, 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 blah. Right. So it says it's decreasing at a constant rate, and that means that the volume is going down with respect to time at a constant. So dV by dt is equal to a negative, because it's going down, constant, which we call C. Okay. Next, I can work out an expression for the volume because I know it's a sphere. So I know the formula for a sphere is 4 thirds pi r cubed. And then I can differentiate that with respect to r. So I get dv by dr. The 3 comes down, times cancels with the third. So I just get 4r squared. Great. Now I want to put it all together. And I want to find dr by dt. That's what I've been tasked to find. Um, so I've been tasked to find yeah, dr by dt. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to, uh, I want a dr on the top. And I've got a dr in my original working. And that was a dv by dr. So I'm going to put that as dr by dv. And then I'm going to multiply that by dv by dt, which is another um, um, derivative which I've already found. And that's going to be perfect because the dv's will cancel and this will be true that it will be dr over dt. So what is dr by dv? It's the reciprocal of dv by dr, which is 1 over 4 pi r squared. And dv by dt is minus c. Okay, so that can therefore be uh, simplified down to get minus c over... 4 pi r squared. Now that looks not like what we've got, but we can do the funky constant swap, which I know students hate this, but essentially a constant is a constant. And we can say that k is equal to the constant c over 4 pi, which is also constant. So by doing that, I can take out that c over 4 pi and I can just replace it with a k. So I get minus k over r squared, which is what they do desire. And the next part says solve the differential equation. In order to solve the differential equation, we're going to need some boundary conditions. I have an initial condition, and I also have a condition after five seconds. And then it also says the volume of the balloon continues to decrease at a constant weight until the balloon is empty. I'm not sure why that's relevant, but whatever. Um, so we need to separate the variables. We need to put the R's on one side, and I'll put them on the left, and I need to put the T's on the other. So I multiply up by R squared and multiply up by DT, and then I integrate. Uh, integrating that up the power to 3, divide through by 3. Integrating this, I will get just minus KT plus C, but I've already used C as a constant, so I'm going to use alpha instead. Um, not to confuse it with the C we used in part A. And some students might say, why can't I put a constant on either side? You can, but then you could just constant swap them to give one constant on one side. So there's no point. You just need a constant on one side when you integrate both sides. Okay, now we need to go and find our boundary conditions. So let's just remind ourselves what they are. They are um, that the initial radius um, is 40. So t equals 0 means initial, and r is 40. So let's sub those in. So I get 40 cubed over 3. I might just leave it like that as 40 cubed. Minus, um, I'll just equals alpha because the, uh, the t cancels because t is 0. And the next boundary condition is that t equals 5, r equals 20. So 
So subbing that in is going to give me 20 cubed over 3 is equal to minus 5k plus 40 cubed over 3 because that's the value of alpha we've already worked out. And now I can work out what k is um, by rearranging that formula and just solving for k essentially. So out comes the calculator. Um, I'm going to do uh, f move the 5k to the other side. Oh no, so let's do 20, um, 20 cubed over 3 minus 40 cubed over 3 and then afterwards I divide through by minus 5. equals divide by minus 5 and that gives me my value for k which is 11200 over 3. Okay. Over 3. Right, I've now found both constants uh, so I've solved my differential equation. I just need to write down the solution which is that r cubed um, over 3 is equal to minus k, which is minus 1100 0, 0 over 3, plus uh, t, yeah, plus alpha, which is 40, uh, 40 cubed, which is 64,000 over 3. And then finally, I can times everything through by 3 just to neaten it up. And I have my solution for r uh, cubed. You could cube root it if you wanted to, but there's, there's no need. That's, that's fine. That is, that is a solution that links r and t. Right, find the limitation of the values. Okay, so this is where it says the balloon gets, uh, um, keeps decreasing until it's empty. So let's figure out what happens when it is empty. That means the radius will be zero. And let's figure out what time that will occur. So I get zero minus um, 1120t plus 64,000. And this will give us my value for t. And this will therefore tell us the limitation of the model because after the radius is zero, we don't want it to keep decreasing because that would be... Um, unrealistic I mean you can't have a negative radius so at that time the model becomes invalid um, because we don't want to have a negative radius so the model is valid until t equals 40 over 7 Bosch differential equations done and is there one question left or two questions left um, oh yes, lucky us, there were two questions left. And this one is a bit tasty actually. A bit of implicit differentiation, a bit of trig as well. Um, so it's asked us to differentiate, so I am going to write that tan y is equal to 9 over x squared. Just get the y's and the x's on, on the same side, on different sides, sorry. Uh, which is 9x to the minus 2. And now I'm going to differentiate implicitly. And whenever I differentiate a function of y with respect to x, I must multiply it by dy by dx. And the derivative of tan is sec squared, which is given in the formula booklet. And then differentiating 9x to the minus 2 gives us minus 18, because the power comes down, x to the minus 3, because the power then drops by 1. Okay. <clears throat> now... Um, we all know that cos squared plus sine squared equals 1. But did you know that if you divide it all by cos squared, then we get another identity, which is very useful. That tells us that 1 plus tan squared is equal to sec squared. 
Okay, that's very useful. It's going to be very useful here because I can rewrite that sec squared now as tan squared plus 1y. Sorry, 1 plus tan squared y. And that's helpful because I know what tan y is in terms of x, which means I can eliminate the y's. So what is tan squared y? Well, tan y is 9 over um, x squared. So tan squared y is 81 over x to the 4, multiplied by dy by dx. And that's equal to 18x to the minus 3. And now I can just divide through to isolate the dy by dx. So that gives me minus 18x to the minus 3 over 1 plus 81x to the 4. And like I said earlier in the video, whenever I have a fraction in a fraction, I will multiply by the denominator of that um, fraction, which in this case is x to the 4. So x to the minus 3 times x to the 4, we add the powers, and minus 3 plus 4 is just 1, so I get 18x to the 1. Uh, 1 times x to the 4 is just x to the 4, of course, and 81 over x to the 4 times x to the 4 is 81. And that is perfect. That's exactly what they want. How lovely. Prove that C has a point of inflection at x equals root or the fourth root of 27. Okay. What is a point of inflection? Well, a point of inflection occurs when the de second derivative equals zero and the second derivative changes sign either side of the stationary point. So the first thing I need to do is work out the second derivative. So I need to use the quotient rule here. So I set u as the numerator to be minus 18 over x, and v as the denominator to be x to the 4 plus 81. And then I differentiate both sides, or both um, terms u and v, and I get minus 18, and I get 4x cubed. And then I know that my product rule, I start with v, which is x to the 4 plus 81. I multiply it by du, which is minus 18, and then I subtract um, minus 18, so that's plus 18, times by 4x over x cubed. So that's the quotient rule, um, which I should have written down on the side, but I didn't. Apologies. But you get given the quotient rule, and it's all over v squared, which is 4, so x to the 4 plus 81 all squared. Okay, there you go. There's the quotient rule done. And now it's just a case of simplifying this down. And remember, we are trying to solve this equal to zero. So we really want our numerator to be something which we can solve. So we multiply out these brackets. Minus 18x to the 4. Minus, actually, no, 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 no. This is not a good way of going about it. Let's take out a factor because both of these terms have an 18 in them. So let's take out a factor of 18. I get minus that first bracket, which is therefore minus x to the 4 minus 81. And I get plus x lots of 4x cubed, so that's 4x to the 4. Ah, that is much easier. Good spot there. So now that numerator simplifies to 18 lots of 3... Yes, yeah, so there's minus x to the 4 plus 4x to the 4, so that's 3x to the 4, minus 81, all over this um, pesky denominator, which I've got to keep writing out every time, even though we're not actually going to use it because we're only going to use the numerator. But anyhow, um, I can take out a factor of 3 from inside the bracket, and 3 times 18 is 54, and I get that x to the 4 minus 17, so I know I'm onto a good thing, because that's very similar to the actual question part. Um, and that equals 0, because I want my second derivative to equal 0, and when a fraction equals 0, it's the numerator that must equal 0, so that x to the 4 minus 27 needs to equal 0, and that gives me that x is equal to 27 taken to the fourth root. But that's not quite enough, because in order to prove that it is a point of inflection, we have to also prove that the second derivative changes sign either side of the point of inflection. Now, we can just state this, because it is relatively obvious that when x is less than 
the fourth root of 27, the gradient is also the second derivative, sorry, is also going to be less than zero. Um, and that is because, well, if I take a value which is smaller than the fourth root of 27, and I take and I take it to the fourth power, that's going to be smaller than 27. And then when I take away 27, it will be negative. Um, and then vice versa, by the same logic, when x is greater than the fourth root of 27, the second derivative will be greater than zero. And that is enough to prove the point of inflection. And as always, top tip, A level, if you've proved something, just write down, I've just proved it, because you will get a mark for a conclusion, and it is a waste of a mark if you don't say, therefore, point of inflection. Right, now we stroll on to the final question, which is a, oh, it's a bit of a humdinger, really. It's, it's a question which I wouldn't really, um, I wouldn't really attempt it unless I've attempted all the other questions, because there's no real obvious way of doing it um, unless you just play around with it for a while. Um, anyhow, a proof by contradiction question, you always assume the opposite. So I'm going to assume that um, P and Q are positive integers such that this expression or this equation, sorry, is true. Because I want to prove that there, there are no positive integers such that it's true. So I'm going to assume the opposite and that there are positive integers such that that is true. I'm going to spot that that's a difference of two squares. And I'm going to factorize it as such. 2P plus Q um, and 2P minus Q. And that equals 25. And now because I've said that P and Q are positive integers, and we have, that means that 2P plus Q must also be an integer, and 2P minus Q must also be an integer. Uh, if you just pause there and try and understand what I mean by that, because again, if those two P's and Q's are integers, then multiplying it by two and adding them together is still gonna give you an integer. And therefore, that means that two integers times together to make 25 can only happen a few ways. It can be 1 and 25. And if that's the case, then 2p plus q would equal the 1. And 2p minus q would equal the 25. And if I add those together and solve them simultaneously, I get that 4p is equal to 26. And therefore, p is equal to 26 over 4, which is not integer. Um, and that contradicts our original statement that P and Q are integer. So I'm just going to write there that that's not integer. Now, that's not the only way that we could, we could times two integers together to get 25. We could also do 5 times 5, of course. And if that is the case, then we would have that 2P plus Q would equal 5, and that 2P minus Q would also equal 5. Again, solving simultaneously, adding together, gives me 4P is equal to 10, and therefore p is equal to 2.5. So that is, again, not integer. Uh, let me just spell that right. Integer. Great. Um, and you might notice that, I mean, you could also say that the other way of doing uh, it is times 25 by 1. So rewriting 2p plus q is equal to 25 and 2p minus q is equal to 1. But that's essentially the same set of simultaneous equations, uh, or at least it gives the same solution, which is that uh, p is equal to um, 26 over 4, which again is not integer. So therefore, once again, always make sure you do that statement at the end. If you've just proved something, tell the examiner you've proved it. And you write, therefore, contradiction. Okay, thank you uh, very much. If you did like that, please do uh, subscribe to my channel. Uh, I post um, A-level videos and GCSE videos and also some puzzles on shorts as well. Um, and also if you could share it with anyone who you know is doing A-level maths or GCSE maths, I would really appreciate that. Um, I have more videos on A-level maths, so do check those out. And thank you very much. Until next time, bye-bye.